All right, as the last few people are getting settled, um, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to the second of our first year program lecture series. And for me, it's a distinct honor to be introducing the individual that you will meet here in a moment. Briefly, I would like to take the time to thank our generous sponsors in Dow Chemical, as well as the FYP Directors Fund, being able to get this auditorium on a Friday night and be able to provide world-class speakers for you is our pleasure, but also not a small undertaking. It is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Jonathan L. Sessler, who received his BS degree in chemistry in 1977 from the University of California, Berkeley. He then obtained his PhD in organic chemistry from Stanford University in 1982 with PhD supervisor, Professor James Coleman, arguably one of the founding members of the organometallic and bioinorganic community. Dr. Sessler has been a professor of chemistry at the University of Texas in Austin. Ah, no. This is where I will prove to you today that Aggies and Longhorns actually do work together. Where he currently holds the Doherty Welch chair, Dr. Sessler has authored or co-authored over 900 research publications, written two books, edited two others, and has been the inventor of record for over 90 issued US patents. To date, Dr. Sessler's work has been featured on or in 50 journals or book covers. Also, Dr. Sessler has served as the associate editor for ChemCom, co-founded Pharmacyclics Incorporated with Dr. Richard Miller, which was acquired by AbbVie for $21 billion in 2015. His techoporphin technology is now the basis for his new company, Innovotex. In addition to him speaking English, he speaks French, Hebrew, Spanish, a little bit of German, some Japanese, and a couple words in Korean. Dr. Sessler's work has been recognized with several awards, including the American Chemical Society Cope Scholar Award and the Royal Society of Chemistry Centenary Surprise, Centenary Prize. He is a member of the U.S. National Academy of Inventors and was named Inventor of the Year by the University of Texas at Austin in 2016. Dr. Sessler was elected a member of the European Academy of Sciences in 2019, was then elected to the U.S. National Academy of Sciences in April of 2021, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in April of 22. He was just recently named the 2024 Stoddard Science Fund Chemist Award E. It is my distinct pleasure and honor to welcome to Aggieland, Professor Jonathan Sessler. So thank you all for being here. You, you heard that I come from TU land or tea sipper land. Um, and I found that tea with vodka is pretty good and we can drink that. Uh, it really is different in Aggie land than in Austin. And I was driving over here, some one of those, as you heard, Berkeley bums, liberal to the core. And I left very blue, if you're into politics, Austin. And I started driving over here and it got redder and redder. And I got all the way to College Station and it was so deeply red, it was maroon. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> and there's a football game tomorrow against South Carolina and I'm gonna have to drive home late. So I went over to the hotel um, to see if they had a room. It was like $457 to stay in the hotel and uh, this didn't make any sense to me because when i walked in it said atm hotel they should give me money we're going to talk about chemistry and drug development and we're going to make fun not of each other because ut austin and tamu we really are the best 
in the state, and I would argue among the very best state schools. And so it's really great to be here. But next week, I have to go to Oklahoma, give a lecture there. The week after that, I'm actually going to Kansas to give a lecture there. And if we think about mascots, Longhorn's not too bad. You can always chop it up and eat it. Reveille is so cute. How could everybody not adore it? Jayhawks, nice little bird. But Oklahoma, my gosh. I, I actually believe that God has a plan for every state in the union. And if you flunk out of freshman chemistry here or in Austin, you can always move to Oklahoma and be the smartest person in the state. But think about their mascot. It's like a schooner. This, they, they've figured out that this having a mascot that's a form of transportation that was obsolete at the time it was being used is no good. So you may have heard they just moved over and changed their mascot to make it a unicorn because that's sexy. Girls like it, it's studly for guys. So here I'm pleased to gig them Aggies. When you come visit us, please salute the Longhorns. And when you go next time you're in Oklahoma, pay respect to their new mascot, the unicorn. I hope that's the first and last time you're flipped off by a professor. <laughs> So let, let's talk a little bit about how we're trying to make drugs and why we got into this. And this will be organic chemistry. I recognize many of you have not yet had that. So we'll try and explain as we go along. First, as always, I'm a professor and you've probably noticed that professors don't actually do anything. We sit in our office and drink coffee. And so science gets done by you, by young people. And as freshmen, maybe not yet, but in four or five years from now, you will be on the front lines of research. And so it's these young people in my lab who have done what I'm gonna tell you about. Particular shout out goes to Jonathan Arambula, who came to my lab about 10 years ago, joint with me and MD Anderson, Calvin Chow, Esther Meyer, helped a lot, Adam Sedgwick, Gregory Theobald, Jin, Jin, Chen have really been the ones I'm going to talk about most today, Masatoshi Oshida, uh, and we'll get started. So this story starts a very long time ago. It starts with a class of compounds called porphyrin. And for the organic chemists, we use these little points or where vertices to show carbon. And then we'll put the other elements in the periodic table here with the actual symbol. So this is nitrogen. And this five-membered ring is called parole. The whole ensemble is porphyrin. And you probably know this as iron, iron porphyrin in our body. We know as heme wrapped in the protein. It's called hemoglobin. And if you cut yourself, it comes out red. That's the color of blood. It changes a little bit whether it has oxygen or not. So I thought this would be great. If you go through and count, there are no fewer than four Nobel Prizes for nature's, we call this tetraparole because there are four of them. And I came to Texas and I thought, okay, I'll keep like my old boss, Jim Coleman, I'll keep working on these porphyrins and maybe People in Stockholm might find a fifth Nobel Prize for me. It seemed like a good idea. Well, I arrived here in Texas. And as we all know, everything in Texas is not only better, it's also bigger. And you can see our rabbits. They're much bigger here than north of the Red River. And you can see the beer, clearly a five-point star. So I needed to make something that was going to be Texasized. So the idea was to chelate the flag or make something that could put a molecule that would make us here in Texas proud. And so that was our logo. And we did that a long time ago, way back in 1988. 
And we published a paper about what we called expanded orphans. So we have been made these Texas sized. That was way back in 1988. This was a two page scientific publication, two pages. 2017, with two friends, we wrote or edited a special issue of Chem Reviews. And this is 2,200 pages or something like that, all on this one theme. And I always worry whether or not our science has had any impact in the broader world. And journals talk about impact factors. But since over the course of my lifetime, we went from two pages to this, this thing weighs about five pounds. So when you come visit us in Austin, come to my office and I'll drop it on your foot and you'll be able to feel the impact of this kind of chemistry. So first, some history. Texafrin, as we called our molecule, was not actually the first expanded porphyrin. That honor goes to somebody named R.B. Woodward, who arguably was the best synthetic chemist in the 20th century. He won the Nobel Prize for the synthesis of one of these tetraproles. He was at Harvard. He loved the color blue. His synthesis of vitamin B12 took some, something like 1,300 man years. And along the way, he had made discovered an impurity. And he didn't pay much attention to it, but he gave it a name. He called it saffron to match porphyrin. And you can see, even if you haven't had organic chemistry, you can see that this is bigger than that. And why is porphyrin called porphyrin? So if you've studied ancient Greek, you know that porphyra means purple. And if you ever get a chance to visit the Vatican Museum, arguably among the wealthiest of museums, they have all kinds of things in purple or porphyra marble. Well, this compound turned out to be blue-green. Those of history of chemistry folks know that R.B. Woodward loved the color blue. So we got this and he called it saffron or sapphire. And he disclosed this in 1966. I wasn't around. Manuel Fogel, the late Emmanuel Fogel, was there, talked about how he presented this. So that's great. And we decided after we made texafrin that we'd start going back and taking a look at this compound that the famous R.B. Woodward had never had time or interest in making. And I had a student, early student, named Mike Sear. And he was at a very different stage of life. I started my job at the age of 28. So I was sort of still a rasty dude working all the time. And Mike Sear was and still is older than me. Funny how that works. And he arrived, he was at a very different stage of life. So he, he arrived, he was married, he had two children and one wife, or maybe he had two wives and one child, I can't remember. But it, it was a completely different stage of life. And Ellen, his wife, would call up and say, you're making Mike work too hard. You should be home for dinner, babysitting, blah, blah, blah. So finally, I said, okay, just make a bunch of metal complexes. So porphyrin, iron, but also magnesium, cobalt, and related compounds. But nothing seemed to work. And so finally, I asked, Mike, why don't you write up how you made this, which was better than Woodward, but only because Woodward didn't care, and get a crystal structure, which allows you to use x-rays to see what the molecule is. And you need small single crystals of high purity. So he worked and worked to get one. And he had a friend, John Seibert, who's now like Dean at UT Dallas, done very well. And John came over to take a look with his little microscope, uh, little um, magnifying glass at the crystal. But here in Texas, especially in the spring, you get cedar fever, at least in Austin, maybe you're exempt from that. And poor John, took a look at the crystal and he had to went and the crystal jumped up his nose. 
So that was our first toxicity study. <laughs> Months later, they got another crystal. They said, boss, wrote a note, boss, we have a crystal structure of suffering. Well, metals go into this, every metal almost in the periodic table, nothing going in here, but he got a crystal. And what we found was that fluoride anion, so this is minus, was going into the center here. And so after the fact, with the help of colleague Brent Iverson, who's one of our spectacular teachers, we realized that this bigger system would act as a base. So all these nitrogens can pick up a proton. Just like if you're taking ammonia, you add acid, you get the ammonium. Then that plus made a nice little ring into which the minus of that. So this was obviously not what we designed. As I said, four Nobel Prizes, a hundred years of looking at metal complexes, all of a sudden we're finding something negative. And anion recognition here, Professor Francois Gabay, one of my heroes and friends, he's one of the leaders in this area. You get a chance to do research with him, I recommend it. He's been very interested in anions. So the world's divided really into cations, which have a plus charge and anions, which have a minus charge. And I guess Francois and I like to do anions because they're minus, and so they match our negative personality. So now you know how it really was. And sitting in a bar, I've made so many mistakes that I now think of my life as pure research. And Einstein always says it nicely. If we knew what we were doing, it wouldn't be research, would it? So that's how we got to this. It turns out anion binding is actually a recurring theme in porphyrin chemistry. We've made many of these now. Here was the saffron. This one we called had an amethyst color. We called it amethrin. This one, which wraps up, is turquoise. So we call it turcosrin. And then at this one we called octafrin one zero 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 one. Was because by now we need some systematic non-color based nomenclature. So. I want to highlight a very early example. So um, Takashi Morishima, he was a master student working at Mitsubishi Company. At the time, they were trying to make new dyes to make liquid crystals. Early liquid crystals were black and white. Mitsubishi was able to make blue and white liquid crystals. Now, of course, we have multiple colors, your screens on your computers all have multiple colors. So they sent him over to make, see if these kinds of dyes might work. And so he made this one. And we don't have to know too much organic chemistry, but we can count one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is getting bigger. And this had a special absorption way out here, which tells us that it had a stability called aromaticity, which was quite a frontier and still is. And for us, this was important because it meant this could be a generalized class of compounds. So great, Texafrin, of course you want to name a molecule after your state. We are not going to call it Oklahoma Frit, okay? Just, to, just so it's clear, not even Arizona Frit, it's Texafrin. We're just going to lay it out plain here. We, we're the best. Us. But could this be generalized? So saffron, texafrin, and now thanks to Takashi, Morishima-san, we know that maybe we have a whole theme. And so this was historically important for us. And again, you see chloride anion in the crystal structure. So you're using x-rays and it has this absorption way out here, which meant that it had this aromatic stability beyond the classic 22 pi electron limit. So within our field, that's important. And if you've studied a little tiny bit of organic chemistry in high school, you know that benzene is sort of a quintessential aromatic compound. And Kekulé proposed the structure and you wonder why in the world he thought that benzene might be hexagonal. I don't know where he got any such hints. So, we think these compounds 
are useful for studying something called aromaticity, which makes molecules particularly stable, as well as anti-aromaticity, which is saying if the electron count is reversed, then you get very unstable molecules. And cyclobutadiene is kind of the poster child for that. And you count the number of electrons in your pi system or the electrons above and below the plane. And if it's 4n plus 2, it should be aromatic. And if you count and you get to 4n, then it should be um, anti aromatic. And I think that kind of counting works really well. Um, and and um, again, I hate to make too much fun of my future hosts next week, but you, you heard about the Sooner who finally got a degree in mathematics for learning how to count to 21, but they arrested him for indecent exposure. And I didn't say that out loud. Okay, so 4N should be particularly unstable. And in fact, when we made this molecule, it rearranged so that it would not be planar, would not have that problem. And so we had the idea that if we could conformationally restrict it by putting on these fused benzenes, then, then we would get there. And so Masatoshi did that. And we do something called NMR spectroscopy, which you will learn at least in sophomore organic chemistry. And so again, carbons are shown as little points, rings, double bonds, or two lines. This H stands for a proton. And inside, it resonates. It feels the ring current, the magnetic effect, sort of the same technology that goes into MR, magnetic resonance imaging. And this is way down here on the parts per million scale. And so that's a hint that this is anti-aromatic. And if you count, again, probably with that, Again, my excuse is if I offended anybody. If you count here, this should be a 24 pi or 4n system. So it, sometimes I like to make jokes. And if I offended anybody, I, I sincerely apologize. But part of stand up comedy or being a chemist, maybe they're the same thing, is sometimes they just bomb. And one of my points which you might not, has nothing to do with chemistry, but maybe something to keep in mind, is that if you're too afraid of having a bad day, you may never have a good day. So you just have to let yourself out and hopefully some of what I say appeals to you and the things that maybe not, just erase them from your mind. Okay, so this is 24 pi electrons, should be very unstable, anti-aromatic, and sure enough, you can then add electrons, sodium dithionide, classic reductant used by biochemists. That puts two electrons in. Now we're up to 26, which is 4N plus 2. And you get this huge change in the NH signal. And as predicted, nice and flat and showing the hallmarks of aromaticity. And again, anion binding. So that's great. Masatoshi did all that. Anti-aromaticity is kind of a big deal. Getting a stable anti-aromatic compound. We were excited. And then he decided to add HCl. And he came running in and said, my molecules disappeared because he couldn't do an NMR spectrum. And what had happened, but he could do an EPR ex experiment. And he did that in the lab of Shunichi Fukuzumi. Fukuzumi was big Japanese boss professor, and he's one of my heroes. Fukuzumi did his um, studies here in the United States with Jay Kochi, who then moved, moved to Houston. Um, he's no longer with us. And I don't know how many of you are non-native English speakers, but probably quite a, quite a number if you're on it. Uh, 
Fukuzumi coming from Japan, obviously not very good at English. And his boss, after six months, said, you're fired. Your English is too bad. Go back to Japan. And of course, being Japanese, goes, Tsumasen, onigashimasu, moichido, onigashimasu, then say, and was allowed to stay. And in 2008, Fukuzumi set the record for the most papers in the Journal of American Chemical Society in a given year. So he's really a role model of how perseverance and study can get you a long way. Anyway, he helped us show this. All this was saying that we now had a very odd number of electrons, which was quite special, and the journal put it on the cover. So what's happening is that with protons, this is electrochemistry, just shows how hard it is to put electrons in. When you protonate it, become much easier, so easy that chloride anion, something we think of as really stable, right? Sodium chloride, that's our table salt. Chloride, so stable, but you know, I'm a sloppy eater and maybe I'll have some snack on the driving home because the hotel's too expensive and it'll fall on my shirt and then I'll have to bleach it. So we're all chemists, we're all familiar with high oxidation chloride, chlorine, hypochlorite as in bleach. So it can't exist. And this compound was so anti-aromatic that it stole an electron from chloride, sodium chloride, pretty stable stuff but oxidized it. So that's what, and the protons help that happen. Uh, so now we're going on to try and push the boundaries of aromaticity. And this is a first generation system, slightly different, so they're two molecules. And what we're trying to do is think about three dimensional molecules. So one dimension, flat molecules, electrons can run around. But what happens if we give the electrons two different choices, little ring, big ring. Do they talk to each other? Does this stay here? Does this go here? Do we get commingling? So that was the scientific question. And it turns out that in the ground state, nothing happens. It just acts like we went to all this work, hard synthetic chemistry, Jung Su Park did that. There's a big ring and a little ring and basically they coexist. There, there's no communication, no marriage. But if you start pulling out electrons, the big ring, like a big particle in a box, if you've done a little bit of quantum mechanics, that comes out first. Then the second one comes out. And now the total number of electrons is 40 or 4n should be anti-aromatic. But this is a biradical. It's two sets of unpaired electrons. So remember, if you're doing your bonding, you do hydrogen, that's great. Helium, you're into the anti-bonding. If you have an unpaired, partly filled orbital, it's not so stable. That's what's going on here. But with two of those, now it's talking and the whole thing acts pretty stable and aromatic. So, um, and with, this is supported by calculations. And a fellow named Baird had predicted this many years ago. And we think this was the first experimental demonstration of that. And you can do this by calculations. These are so-called nuclear independent chemical shifts and the strong negative value is consistent with aromaticity. Um, so we like this chemistry of paroles. I was giving a lecture at Northwestern and one of the students um, really wrote, wrote this, sketched out this cartoon, which is Jonathan Sessler sentenced to life without parole. So that's how you spell those five membered rings. And of course, we're always joking that we feel like we're in jail because we're always on parole, we're being let out for good behavior. So we're having fun making all kinds of fancy elaborate molecules, making molecules in the take up three-dimensional space is not so easy. So here's one, here's the control system. And you can see the three-dimensional system. These are just reflections of a color, how much light it's going 
in and at what wavelength. And this compound goes from sort of non-aromatic to aromatic. When you protonate all the nitrogens, the electrons can move around a lot more easily. And again, this is the kind of thing that keeps us busy. We're trying to make analogies between belts or tubes and retain the parole chemistry that can be used to bind anions or capture cations. And this is not easy chemistry. The yield for this particular one was 0.76%, which means you put 100% in and you only get a tiny bit out, even less of this nicely symmetric one. And Yu Ying did this chemistry, um, but it was considered a pretty spectacular molecule and was lucky enough to be highlighted on the journal of this Journal of American Chemical Society, which is one of our top journals in chemistry. So that was fine. And so we really think aromaticity is kind of fun. And um, this is one of astrophysics colleague, maybe. You can see we have the same hairstyle. Uh, he's going along with antimatter and dark matter. We've recently discovered the existence of dust matter, which appears to have no effect on the universe whatsoever. So probably you're thinking that aromaticity, what's this guy, Dr. Sessler, talking about? How many electrons and blah, blah, blah. Uh, yes, it's important in terms of understanding the theory of stability of organic compounds. It has a lot to do with where they absorb light, how long and where those excited state separated electrons go. And so the real issue to us is beyond this academic curiosity in publishing papers, can we do something useful? So what have we done so far? We've looked at compounds that switch their character, aromatic to anti-aromatic, non-aromatic to aromatic. And we're sort of learning the rules for that switching. So one of them is if you protonate, it becomes easier to do that switching. So can we use that as a trigger. So can we make molecules that are on and off? And what function do we want to elicit to control in that manner? So I'm going to give one example that we're working on, and that involves photoacoustic imaging. So I think we're all more or less familiar with ultrasound. So what's ultrasound? It's sound beyond what you can hear. It's in clinical practice. If you're pregnant, for instance, in almost every pregnancy, you get that internal disease, you'll get an ultrasound. So what's that? How's that working? It's putting in sound and looking how it's reflecting back. Kind of a little bit like radar for people. Sound we can hear, ultrasound is beyond what our ears can hear. Photoacoustic imaging, we think could be a new technique that complements classic ultrasound. Ultrasound doesn't give you great sensitivity, but we think that by adding molecules and turning them on and off, we might be able to do something in that area. So this is a little complicated. What we're gonna do is heat up a spot, first in mice, maybe ultimately in people, and then that heat will make a little habitation, which will make some noise. So that all sounds very complicated. But this morning, I started by making coffee. And how do I make coffee? I take the coffee kettle, I hold it under the sink, and I fill it up with water. And then I put it up, plug it in, and it starts warming up. And if you've ever heated up a kettle, electronically or on the stove, listen, it makes noise. You're heating up the water, it's starting to vibrate a little bit, it's cavitating. That cavitating, it expands, contracts, expands, comes out as noise. And we see that, hear that popping maybe in the summer, we 
let our cars out, they get kind of hot, we, right? Then we can cook an egg on the dashboard that's special to Texas. I once had a whole recipe book on food you could cook in your car in the summer in Texas, like ham and eggs and things like that. Anyway, the heating makes noise, just like your coffee pot. Instead of using a coffee pot, we're gonna use a laser. And so we're gonna take laser, we're gonna use that heat to make a spot that's gonna give local warming and that'll come out as ultrasound. So we'll start with laser, that'll give a RF pulse, it'll get absorbed, that'll go to an excited state, this is called the Jabolinsky diagram. Once you're in an excited state, it can go into the triplet, it can come back out as light, that's called fluorescence, maybe you can't read that, goes in the triplet, can come out as light, it's phosphorescent, or it can come out just heating as heat, thermal expansion. Thermal expansion, remember, just like a popping of our kettle will make an acoustic wave. It's beyond what we can usually hear. And then we'll use ultrasound because it's beyond what we hear. And then we'll just use the typical ultrasound imaging. So for photoacoustic imaging, we don't want it to come out as light. We don't want it to go into the triplet. We want it to come out as heat. So we want to take our laser and we want to heat. And we want this to be done um, with red light. And of course, since we're, so can this photo couple, proton couple electron transfer, the aromaticity switching be used to control photoacoustic imaging. And I love this cartoon because it's like a, gullibility test. If you put $1 in, then your gullibility, of course, is just a fancy word for being easily fooled. So for $1, you can test whether or not you're gullible. And guess what? You don't need a machine. Just anybody want to give me a dollar? I'll tell you whether you're gullible or not. <laughs> no takers. You guys are too smart. Okay. Well, it's worth a try. And anyway, can we use a laser to heat up our molecules and then switch them on and off. So in one state you see it, one state you don't. And we're gonna to wanna to use light that goes through your body. So if I take my lovely green pointer and I put it against my skin, you don't see very much. All the blood absorbed it. Blood is red because it absorbed the blue green light. All that was left was red. So we need to use red light and, and I don't know about you, but you know, when I was a kid, I'd hide under the covers with my flashlight, right? And you'd hold up your finger. Ooh, red. How cool was that? And why is that? Because the blue green light was absorbed by your blood, which left only red to go through. So, what's the corollary? It means if I come with red light, I can get it deeper into your body. So to do this properly, I need a molecule that's bigger than a porphyrin that has this aromaticity so that it is absorbing not blue green light, but the red light that the porphyrin didn't in your blood did not absorb. Because if I was using normal light, it wouldn't work. So this big molecule, one of our expanded porphyrins, was what we're going to test. And we had hoped that this would switch, so as, as I said, we add protons, we can switch from non-aromatic to aromatic or from anti-aromatic to aromatic. That has a big change in the color. And we had hoped that we could do this at about pH six. That's still my dream, haven't gotten there. Why pH six? Because cancer rapidly proliferating, it's outstripping everything. It becomes a reducing environment and it becomes an acidic environment. So if I could have just a light-based technique to see whether or not you have a cancer and by using our molecules, look pretty deep in your body, that would be a dream come true. Still a challenge? We have not met that challenge. Turns out this molecule, the best we have so far, switches at about pH 4, pH 3. And so Adam and Chen Jing, we sat around and scratched our heads. Well, it's not going to help in the diagnosis of cancer, but it turns out 
probably it's happening to you now. I'm droning on and on. Your blood sugar is going down. You're getting hungry. When you get hungry, the pH in your stomach drops, becomes more and more acidic so that you can get ready to digest Dixie chicken or whatever you're going to have for dinner when I finally shut up. That drop in pH is about pH three. So we decided we would test this and we got a mouse volunteer. Xinjing's now back at Shenzhen, Southern China. Took mouse volunteer, stuck it in his ultrasound system. And what, what do we do? We now add our molecule, stick it in, and beforehand, no image. Put in a molecule, you start to get, and it gets brighter and brighter in time. Why? Because the mouse is getting more and more hungry. Okay. 15 minutes for us, we can tolerate that. But if you're over time, your blood sugar goes down, you get more and more hangry, right? Your pH of the stomach is going down. And so what happens if you have too much acid reflux? You take a Tums, a bicarb. And so we fed the mouse some bicarbonate and it made it disappear. What's that do? It changed the pH of the stomach. So it's more neutral. But over time, the mouse gets hungry again, and it, and it comes back. So um, I don't think we can really solve the world's problems. We don't have a cancer detection system. But I can tell you if your pet mouse is hungry. <laughs> Some progress. <laughs> OK. And finally, I want to talk about, give a brief update on our Texafrin drug discovery efforts, which is really where and why I'm probably here to chat with you. So this is really fundamental versus applied chemistry. So most of what we've talked about has been pretty fundamental. And this guy is going just a reminder, deadline coming up soon. And, and the right brain, left brain, shut up. And, and um, so the question is, can texafrins be good for something? And I, I'm much more on, on this side. Those of you who get to know me will realize I have inherited my mother's disorganizational skills. And, and the other way of putting that is you probably studied delta G, right? Delta H minus T delta S. So you know that things can either be entropy driven or enthalpy driven. And so I'm a totally entropy driven chemist. It's lucky I can get my shoes on. Oh, with my lovely Halloween socks. Okay, so can we can texafrins be useful? Well, early on, we found that they were easy to reduce. Dirk Gouley, now famous Zaid Chai professor in, in near Munich, showed that it was really easy to put electrons into texafrin. That means it's easy to take them back out. So if you put an electron into texafrin, oxygen will take it back out. But that electron had to go somewhere. And so it makes a reduced form of oxygen called superoxide. And that dismutates to peroxide, which is an apoptosis or programmed cell death trigger. And that was all coming out about the time we made this molecule. And so I teamed up with Richard Miller, early photo shown here, to start a company to try and progress this. And that sounds really simple and boring. The actual story is maybe a little different. So I was a senior in college and I had a cold that never went away. And I had some ache under my arm and my older brother was studying medicine. And you know, older brothers are always slapping the younger brothers and sisters around. And he kept saying, oh, you gotta go get that checked out. And so finally, just to shut him up, I went and I was took chest x-ray on Thursday, Tuesday, staging laparotomy. And within two weeks, I was on radiation therapy for stage 3B Hodgkin's lymphoma at age 20. It's a little older than you are, but still not so far from where you're sitting to feel the little shadow across your head. Three years later, the disease relapsed, and I was assigned to a young Richard Miller, who was working on anti-idiotype antibodies that became the basis for 
all the antibody drugs to IDEC. And I kept going to checkups and whatnot. And I said, when I was coming for therapy when I, as a grad student, he kept saying, why are you working on these porphyrins? How are you going to cure cancer with them? And we finally made Texafrin, which had these interesting redox properties. So we decided to start a company. And Richard quit IDEC to become CEO. And so the two of us did this based on this molecule. And the idea was that we could put gadolidium in the middle, and that would allow us to do MR imaging, and then maybe lutetium, which will allow us to control the excited state and make all these reactive oxygen species. And so this is way down in the lanthanide part of the periodic table. And I, I don't see a periodic table here. Fortunately, I always carry one with me. So can everybody see that? <laughs> so way down the bottom of the periodic table, right in the middle, is an element called gadolidium. And I'm, I'm losing my wallet. What's in my wallet? Not very much. Um, <laughs> so this could be good for MR imaging. And ultimately, we focused on metastatic brain cancer. So the idea is that we would make these reactive oxygen species, we'd be able to see. And after a few years of running around, we've got venture capital money for that. And we started Pharmacyclics. Um, for a combination mostly of business, but some science, we ended up focusing on metastatic brain cancer. So this is cancer that's moved from other parts of your body into your brain. And unfortunately, after getting all the way through phase three, we found Murphy's law. Hell, and that's basically saying if something bad can happen, it will. And so th this is an Irish expression. It's not really an expression of optimism, but the Hungarians have something that's similar. Today is worse than yesterday, but it's better than tomorrow. This is not the optimism we want here, here in Texas. But what happened? We got all the way through phase three. So this is hundreds of millions of dollars. And it was rejected in 2007. What had happened is that two of the centers, so these big clinical trials, I'm a chemist. And they, once it goes to them, they took over two of the centers in Lille, France, waited almost two months till they put the patients on the clinical trial. And that was enough to skew the whole trial. And there was nothing in the protocol that said you couldn't do that. So that was sort of our mistake, not saying don't do something stupid like turn left into oncoming traffic. Who does that? Um, and as I said, when I was diagnosed within a week, I was in surgery and then on to therapy. So we take cancer very seriously. And but they anyway, that's what happened. And but out of this gadolidium texafrin, which has a USAM name, Motexafrin gadolidium turned out to be exceedingly safe, at least as a cancer drug. And sadly, there's still no alternative treatment for metastatic brain cancer. And my brother-in-law passed away from this disease five and a half years ago. All that mattered at the time was the statistics or p-value. And I, as a former cancer patient, I still find this hard to grasp because this was better than nothing. But that's how it was. And I knew we were in trouble because I was giving a talk in France, I got on the plane, pharmacyclic stock was worth $20 a share. I got off the plane in Dallas and it was trading at $1.50. And I go, this isn't good. And the CEO, I'm afraid gentlemen, this doesn't call for a drink, but let's have one anyway. And of course, Homer Simpson has it, says it better. And he goes to alcohol, the cause of and solution to all life's problems. And I hope you're at the age where you're not doing this by experiment, but uh, I'm at the age where my blood sugar goes down, doesn't matter. But if my blood alcohol level goes down, I get really grumpy. We knew that biotech is a risk. And the minute we started this clinical trial, my former student then at Pharmacyclics, Darren Magda, was charged with finding a backup. And so Gilead was one of our 
Peter Durbin started that co-founded that company. They went from triple helix DNA to antibiotics. So we knew, and what one of the differences between academics where you focus to try your research to get your project done, published, you may have heard publish or perish. It's now so competitive, it's publish and perish. That's so different than in business where your job is to find some success and put your ego aside. So Darren went around and he found a couple of backups. The first of that was an HDAC inhibitor. That actually did not work. The backup to the backup was a Burkitt tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Nobody wanted this molecule because it was a covalent, it would bind to the active site of that kinase, which puts phosphate and turns on the cancer. But we knew that in cancer, the options are death or try something. And that one turned out to be pretty good. What happened is the board kicked out Richard Miller, Bob Duggan, who had made money on robotic surgery, did a hostile takeover, fired Richard. I quit in protest because I'm not going to help you know, this guy who saved my life. So I'm going to be loyal to him. And um, then this became a huge success. And the first approval came in 2013. And as you heard, this sold for a whole bunch of money. And this drug is being used to treat 40% of all leukemia patients. So um, come what may, that, that's something that can't be sniffed up. And if you wanna read this whole soap opera, I recommend this book. So this is after Miller and me left. I think I'm gone by page 18. Miller's gone by page 30. So Bob Duggan had no training in oncology, but he knew how to push, push, push business. And he had put 80 million of his own money into this company to keep it going. And then when it sold, he got $3 billion out of it. And he gave it to the Church of Scientology. So he's now ahead of Tom Cruise. Uh, his money, he could do whatever he wants, but it's a whole total soap opera. Oh, and he had fired a bunch of people two of whom were so mad they went and started another company and that company sold for $8 billion. So there, if, if you succeed, it's good. Okay, so scientists, we never get any money, but we, I got a little bit, bought a lake house and some toys. So please come to Austin, we can have some fun. So what are we doing now? We're inspired by the fact that this shows good localization to cancer. That's been known in the porphyrin business for a long time, but it holds for texaferrin, the gadolidium, allows us to see it. And so this has been our inspiration to try and bring these back into a clinical setting. So we all have goals, maybe young, ambitious, your, your goal is to, I don't know, play football, win a Nobel prize. My goal is to get one more compound into the clinical. So I'm a chemist, I have a PhD. PH, we pronounce F, like fake doctor. And if I can hand this off to the people doing clinics, like my older brother, that's MD, and that's pronounced money doctor. So that's my goal is to get one more compound into the hands of the money doctors. So what are we doing? We're trying to take approved, FDA approved drugs like cisplatinum, which is basically a glorified rat poison, and try and deliver it to a cancer. So the texaferrin localizes, that's a combination, for those of you who care, receptor-mediated endocytosis, enhanced permeation retention effect. So now we're not gonna try and use that for its own attributes, but rather just as a school bus to deliver these toxins, which normally would go all over your body. And for the subtleties, we're gonna use platinum four, that gets reduced to platinum two, and the texaferrin will help target. And so tumors are reducing because they outstrip their blood supply. And maybe the texaferrin could help with the targeting. So platinum four gets to the cancer, it's reduced to platinum two. Then that does the canonical Steve Lippert DNA kinks. And he won the cotton medal here a few years ago. I came over to celebrate that. He hasn't won a Nobel Prize, but he, I hope he will. 
And so the question will Texaprin help? So we knew that Texaprin combined reducing metabolites like ascorbate, hand that off maybe to platinum. And I don't know if anybody knows what this is. It's a typewriter. And I'm so old, I had to type my PhD. It took like two weeks just to type it. And if you make a mistake, there's no backspace. You have to rip out the page and start again. And so finally, the big day for my PhD came, put on the tie, walk in, and I heard Henry Talby talking to my boss. Hey, this is 160 pages of typing. And Talby goes, I think this is a pretty good dissertation. I read the first 16 pages. And well, I was pretty upset. And I asked afterwards, I said to my boss, Professor Talby only read 16 pages. And he goes, did you sign it? And I go, yeah, keep it. It's going to be worth a lot of money. Well, three months or 15 months, I can't remember later, who wins the Nobel Prize? Henry Talby. So all of a sudden, my attitude changed completely. Instead of his only reading 16 pages, he signed my dissertation. Why do you win the Nobel Prize? Something that we think is just obvious. Inner sphere versus outer sphere electron transfer. If bonds are actually touching, electrons move faster. But in, when, until we figure that out, nobody knew. And so that's just a reminder. And the idea is that maybe by using texaprin, we can help this electron transfer. Because here we can have binding. Texaprin lives a long time in its reduced form. So we do this by MTT assay. You take a dye. If the cells are alive, it turns purple. And if they're dead, it stays clear. And you plot concentration versus percent. So the further this is over to the left, the more toxic your compound. And so if you take texaprin, not so good. You take platinum, not so good. You mix them together, much better. But that's not a drug. Drug, you want to have things all going together. So Greg and Jonathan stuck oxaliplatinum in the four oxidation state. So this is a pro drug of a FDA approved drug. Hits the reducing environment, falls out, gives an FDA drug. And so we think this all works. And here's just the data that had us very excited. So we're doing something called patient derived xenograft. This standard of care for ovarian cancer is one of these platinum drugs. This is a cancer that came from a lady who died of ovarian cancer. And the platinum drugs just did not work. And she donated her body to science. This cancer from her, that tumor, has never seen glass, never seen plastic, never been frozen. It's kept alive in a mouse. When it gets too big, they take a chunk and put it in a new mouse. So it's considered a reasonable model for clinic. And if you use saline, tumor grows like mad. It was a tumor site. If you use the platinum drug, didn't work on her and it didn't work in our cancer, not, no better than salt solution. But if you use our compound, then we're stopping the cancer growth at least for a long time. And by the time all the other mice are dead, most of ours on our drug are still alive. And it's well tolerated. This is just showing change in body weight. So this was pretty exciting. This led to this new technology being out licensed in 2019. It's the basis of this new company. Stay tuned, we'll see what's happening. We have a lot of work to raise money and go further. But we're looking at other models. So beyond ovarian, platinum resistant ovarian cancer, which is still a huge problem, no solution. To look at colon cancer, which is an even more challenging problem. And it's getting younger and younger. So juvenile colon cancer. These are much slower, but again, the normal drug didn't do any good and ours seems to be doing well. And oh, by the time the study ended after a few months, again, most of those on the drug. And so why are we so concerned? I don't, um, we're testing over and over again, this idea of reproducibility. Last thing I wanna do is get back to stealing money from venture capitalists. Well, actually I would love to do that. Um, but get back to the clinic and have Murphy's Law take over. 
So in 2017, I was giving a lecture at Yale and I was going from there to Saudi Arabia, from Saudi Arabia to China. And I was thinking about Murphy's Law, which of course comes from Irish Americans, but there's just not that many Irish Saudis. And there's just not that many Irish Chinese. And I was complaining to my teacher who happened to be there at the same time, Dick Sayre, that I had to explain Murphy's Law. And he gave me his proof of Murphy's Law. So let me share that with you. So if you're Irish, I once heard an Irish joke, three Irishmen walked out of a bar. It could happen. Anyway, you might drive into the ocean. Then you need a tow truck. You've got to fish out the car. But of course, Murphy's Law takes over. So now you sit around. If you watch Jaws, you know you have to get a bigger tow truck. Things are looking good. But of course, Murphy's Law <laughs> takes over. OK, so that's it. That's the last I want to tell you about um, Texas size chemistry. We all know things here are bigger. Um, go to the car wash, you might see a pickup truck. You, might, you won't see a little car. You might see a cowboy washing a cow. I've been in Texas for almost 40 years. I have never washed a cow in a car wash, but I have washed a dog because once I had a girlfriend with a dog and got all dirty, it's not so easy because this is high pressure. And if you're not careful, the dog goes every which way. So that's it. Thank you very much. I'm going to talk to all these people. Students, I know that you guys have other places to go and all that sort of thing, but we do want to thank you. Honestly, Dr. Sessler, thank you for everything. It is on, on our behalf of the FYP program that we want to give you that. Thank you. Students, thank you for your time on a Friday night. Please be safe. Thank you for everything. And Dr. Sessler, we wish you the best and hope you are number five on that Nobel Prize list. <laughs>